Hi, Sean. Hey, Armstrong. How you doing? Hi, Joya. I'm doing good. Yeah. Hi, everyone. All right. Let's see. I'm late for the minutes, but I found them. It's like y'all are already in there. Oh, I put myself, I just put myself under the last meeting. What's our agenda, Armstrong? I don't know how much was discussed last time when I wasn't able to be here. We were just talking about there's an issue in the um, evolution working group, which is right here. Let me copy that again. Um, and there's a list of mm -hmm. metrics we need to develop for the metrics models. Oops. Yep. Um, so those are the lists and it's kind of big. So so yeah, we were just wondering if there's a timeline on those or like if there's more that are some that are more um, a high priority than others or do you know, Sean? Well. Or Shoya, I don't know if you know either. I'm just looking at um Based on the discussions I've been in, I would say that four, five, and six are second priorities, and that one, two, three, seven, and eight have been in need for a longer period of time. I was making out. Do we want are you putting that in the issue, Sean? Yep. Yep. Okay. Yeah, I'm making a comment. There we go. Do we want to, how do we want to split up the work? Do we want to take like one metric each? Do we want to just do them all collaboratively? How do we want to do it? What do you think, Armstrong? Yeah, I think uh, we could use a hybrid kind of uh, method. People can choose what they are more comfortable with and things that are a little bit uh, not so clear for people. We can discuss that in a general working uh, group like this. So, I mean, uh, just a way of saying if we have more to be more efficient in a way, because we will still have to discuss everything, you know, it's just if, for example, Elizabeth, if you look into the list, you see something that you can speed up, you work, Sean, myself, and many others could uh, do the same thing. But if there is something that people say, oh, no, this I'm not very clear, then we can discuss that in a meeting generally. Then while we come back now with our individual contribution, we can now discuss them. I don't know if that is something we could uh, practice. So we can still pick one and we just follow the the, the, the the listing or the ranking that Sean suggested, like the number one, we can just take it and then we do it the next time we continue like that. It all, For me, it all depends on how we are more comfortable in working for high productivity. 
So I think it might be helpful to do one um, together. Okay. Just and then maybe do some asynchronous assignment, like because we have, the, I think we have the time, and we could use our meeting this way. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, uh, yeah. if we can, we go with one. Well, what do you want? Uh, Elizabeth have something to say? I just I was asking if we have a preference. So uh, I'm fine with starting with number one and doing it as a group today. That's fine. Yeah. Yeah. That's okay. Okay. Can we just to run around to discuss some of the research? Do you want me to pause the recording too while we're kind of working in the doc? Because it's kind of boring for people. I think. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think you're probably right. It's Watch. Like Watch us all furiously typing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 So to answer the question, how do, how do we track activity in the repository to know to know if it is what, Joya? Mm, yeah, that, that is a question. I, like, so I, I, looking for looking for patterns. Yeah, if there so are. The, yeah. The way the way I've looked for patterns is twofold. One, you can just take straight up time and the activity metrics and evolution that occur through time, they tend to be cyclical. And so if you just take plain old time, you'll see cycles. And I think in many cases, if you look at the time in between releases as the unit of time, which requires you to gather the release data, then you can show the cycles between releases, which is, I think, the most ordinary way that projects operate, at least for those that actually do releases, which is most of the significant ones. Yeah, like looking from um, um, a time series style. Um, do you mind if I share my screen? No, not at all. In fact, I'm a visual person, so that might make it easier for me to um, so oh, yeah, I started the recording again too. So if I need to shut it off, let me know. Um, okay. Yeah, I think it's okay to share um to public share this. Um, yeah, I don't I don't see anything uh, deeply proprietary about line graphs. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's just um like uh, this. These are the um, archived repositories and um. Uh, uh, these are the curves, um, the history curves um, from the day it's created and um, um, to the day of uh, it has its last commit. So, uh, um, yeah, uh, the, the, the white. Well, I see, uh, I see yeah, a pattern. A, yeah, it's the number of commits. And um, no, but I see, I see like before it's archived, in most cases, it tends to trail off. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. Right? And, um, like the pattern's pretty clear there. And you yeah. Can, you can observe um like there, there's a hockey stick at the end of a few of them though <laughs> wait 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 yeah. one more commit yeah. before we archive it yes what is and your I, time stamp like uh, zero to five what does that represent oh uh this is months like uh the first month. Month. okay it has yeah it okay. exists for 30 months okay so I think they can actually be grouped into different patterns because you can see some of the projects and many of them they they they, they have just been active for like uh during its creation and then it's just uh, it has a long tail and it have and some of the projects it, you can observe its growth and its its declination so uh it has there been um like uh the um similar study to summarize this kind of patterns and i wonder if this is meaningful to I, so i think I think it's meaningful. I think, you know, I haven't read all the literature, but the, the literature I've read is really often focused on some small collection of projects. It isn't typically um, at any level of scale. 
So looking at these patterns across a large number of archived repositories, I think you've, I think that's a pretty adequate niche that um, yeah. hasn't been examined. One thing I would suggest is that you look and see, you might consider examining the um, patterns at, at, uh, at, a, at on different scales to see if, for example, ones that go above 400 activity items um, behave differently than the ones that peak in the 100s or 200s because I can see that your y-axis essentially varies based on the data yeah. that you're collecting and, the, and so these graphs are compressing out what might be an interesting insight that would be observable if they were all at the same scale so that you might see at projects with higher levels of activity may peter out at it in a different way than projects with lower levels of activity. We, we can, I think we can group the yeah. projects with similar yeah. patterns and um, standardize. Yeah. You can, the... yeah, you can also do the similar patterns and you can also do the similar project. For example, just an example, if you are comparing uh, Google Cloud to Azure, that's a healthy comparison. Because the time, the timeline, I'm just giving example to understand the, the direction of the project. So the activities will be expected and the kind of uh, analysis, because if you look uh, critical, I just look vividly in your chat. I don't really see any seasonality, which might mean a very uh, good interpretation for some ways. And in some other activity, it might be a questionable uh, interpretation that uh, you don't have seasonality. So it might be the patterns were just like uh, one time or a random thing. It depends on the interpretation at this level. And this kind wow. of analysis is so healthy. Uh, if you remember last week, Elizabeth, we were talking about this kind of pie touch kind of thing. This is a, a practical use case that she's bringing up. And I really like this way of analysis. So if you want to group this kind of project, there are so many ways you can group. And anytime you are doing kind of comparison with data, I hope you know the statistical complexity in doing that. You always need to be adjusting things. It's not only about the visual. Sure, to yeah. know if they are significant. Yeah. So you need to take care of those kind of uh, correction factors. But it's an interesting uh, finding because one thing is we don't want to be comparing apple to banana all the time. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, some like to Armstrong's point, I think some of these projects, these based on the line graphs illustrate a pattern of basically dumping the code and then doing almost nothing with it afterwards. So that's where you've got your peaks on the far left and then it just drops off and is kind of very flat until the end. And I think you've got other patterns where you can see obviously the initial repository creation, but there's higher levels of activity as we go through time. Shoya, are you hoping to um bring together some sort of reason for this pattern to drop off or a set of reasons or are you just basically um saying here's here's what i see uh yeah i was um things uh, i already um like uh, all this 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 projects i i kind of um uh from um, from surveys and um, uh, reading their readmes, I kind of um, ha have the reasons why the projects are archived. So I wish to um, perform some cross analysis um, and to find maybe there are there have patterns, um, there have some relationships among its patterns and um, the reasons it was archived, but I'm not sure if it indeed have ha have this kind of relationship, but I think um, uh, the patterns might, as Xiao and Armstrong um, pointed, there are some relationship um, related to it, the nature of this project, like its technology domain and um, its vision or its uh, programming la language, and maybe, um, yeah. The, um yeah because the one there COVID-19 
India. Like that's probably why there was, a, you know, yeah. like there's high yeah, intensity. Yeah, that's a pretty straightforward one. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so I just was curious Good if you were going to But by the way, there is one, uh, uh, this guy Sanufo with Software Heritage. I know he, he does a lot with, with Archives Project because the reason he created that project was to open a kind of museum for softwares. So, and he has a lot of tools. He also does a lot of publication. Let me share the link here with you. I've, uh, I'm collaborating with him. So I, I know he does a lot of work that uh, looks interesting in this kind of domain. Might be your goals can be different, which is expected. The other thing is, if you have patterns in your, your quantitative analysis that are not accountable for your quantitative analysis, might be you need to revisit your quantitative analysis to see how the data were collected. Because things like this go to the initial readme me file and towards the end when they were closing the readme me file, sometimes the discussions in those things you know, you can capture them to know what was happening with those communities. And I, 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 I did this kind of analysis, I think with OpenStack and the Linux kernel and Apache. And I realized that sometimes some projects are merging. Yeah. They have, yeah, because of several reasons, might be fundings, might be people were not really contributing and the project was a good for the community. They realized that they had to merge. So, at that time, if you just analyze the committee, you will see that at some point this project ceased to exist, but no, it just transformed into another project, which is a kind of evolution that it underwent. So all those qualitative should you should really have a rich set of qualitative data. Maybe you can mine the mailing list, the the readme files, the commit messages to have this kind of uh, understanding. Okay, thanks. I've heard of uh, the software heritage. Thanks for sharing. Okay. I will, yeah, look okay. into. Okay, and another another question I, um, I want to have is, I, I kind of want to have some, um, make some comparisons uh, uh, evolution wise uh, and um, to compare between the archived, uh, maybe especially the dead the projects that are archived and actually are maintained, not the project that are evolved in other places, and compare them with maybe the healthy projects. Um, uh, so, um, like, like, like um, there are some machine learning method can be applied, like I can run a logistic regression and um, just input those these archived projects and um, um, the projects maybe uh, use star as the proxy of popularity, uh, like the most popular and um, still active repositories and um, um, using the quantitative um, metrics under the evolution working group and um, um, using them as the um, the the char characteristics um, but um, I'm not sure um, if this can prove that on um, the highly related um, characteristics uh, like those metrics uh, if they show um, uh, high re relevance uh, um, um, w well can that be tell that the, the metric is more important than others so more important than others in terms of acting as a signal of uh, how the project's operating with regards to whether it's healthy or not yes so I think the way I would approach that is I would try to qualitatively identify projects that people consider to be healthy as a reference point, look at the patterns that exist in those, and then look for other projects that have similar patterns. So it's better to do this in a qualitative No, I mean, what I'm saying is you can get your ground truth about quote unquote, what a healthy project is from the yeah. qualitative analysis. So it's like from interviews or referrals from people. I think determining health with the data from a repository without having some kind of 
ground truth about what are the set of healthy projects that people can refer to. It just, it becomes kind of a quantitative, it's a dance because quality is ultimately, or, or um, sustainability is ultimately a subjective thing. Like people are making a judgment. Mm -hmm. And if we can get people to make judgments about a set of repositories that they consider healthy, then we have a really good reference point when we're doing the quantitative analysis. We can ground the quantitative analysis in a qualitative, um, in qualitative, okay. uh, I want to, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, it's not the word truth, but it's something like, it's like a ground truth um, in open, you know, um, in yeah, grounded I theory, it's like a ground truth, but it's not quite that. You won't, you won't get to saturation, but it's, it's like, it's grounded in perception instead of numbers we make up. Yeah, that's a good suggestion. And um, the thing is we, cannot determine that the projects on github with most stars are the healthy projects so no you can't yeah. assume that yeah. <laughs> yeah that's why i think i buy sean's idea because when you go qualitatively there are lots of uh, methodology or uh, techniques that you could use on those kind of data even when you are learning hearing from people for example, counterfactual, you have content analysis, grounded theory, there are so many of them that you can use. The more data intensive technique you use, the more you remove human biases at the end of it. So you will have a kind of a ground truth. I will, I will not be too shy to borrow that word from Sean because it's, it's based on data. And when people's opinion leverages out, then the, the, the truth about that data starts surfacing itself. At the end of the day, you have some indicators. Yeah, because even when you go to Stack Overflow, sometimes you see an, an answer with uh, the best answer ticked, but you go below, you see the optimal answer without community approval, but it might be came later, but that's the most accurate answer. So five stars and all those things might not tell all the story. That's why we have metrics to measure. But at the end of the day, if you use something like transformers in natural language processing, once you have that initial value, you cannot dump a lot, huge data now for your model to identify some of those things that manually it would take a longer time to do, or somehow humanly impossible on larger uh, repositories. So might be you want to bring in that machine learning uh, when you start with the human aspect of it to start identifying you see those patterns you see those things happening you cannot train some uh, your transformer or any other model using attention mechanism or any other thing you are more comfortable with okay thanks for the suggestion mm -hmm. um so i think it's just move move to or, or it's not not even a good research question to try to compare, um, uh, try to like compare if um, what a, a set of metrics are um, better than another set of metrics to. So, so, yeah. I, so I think it is a good research question. It's because you can look at which which metrics correspond more closely with projects that people identify as healthy. And I do mm -hmm. think that you're likely to find distinctions that some metrics will reveal themselves as being more strongly correlated with projects that people consider healthy. So I, I do, th I actually think it's a worthwhile area of inquiry. But we need to find or uh, we have a qualitative consensus to define which set of projects are healthy. Yeah, and it doesn't have to even be a consensus. It can be a, like a half a dozen informants that are heavily engaged in a number of projects or have been in open source for years. And oh. they can identify ones that they think function in a healthy manner. And you should, um, I would recommend leading them toward what what are the signals of health like? So healthy could mean sustainable with an adequate community around it. Healthy could mean both of that and attention to DEI kinds of 
of things. So depending how you frame what is healthy or what is sustainable for them, um, like you want to try to ask, ask it in an open-ended way, but um, what can, it's a very vague question. So you may have to provide them more context in terms of a definition of healthy or sustainable. Okay. Um, and the, con the context could be, I would expect the context to be different if you're asking about the larger scale projects compared to if you're asking about more of the, the niche projects with less activity. Um, like I would expect you to get more people identifying the big projects. Um, but you could do what's called a snowball sample. And I'm just rambling here, mm -hmm. so stop me. But you could do a snowball sample where some informants could give you a list and then you could ask them to recommend other folks to identify healthy projects or sustainable projects. And, you know, you could accomplish a broader survey with, with that kind of snowballing approach. Yeah. But I wouldn't yeah, get too wrapped up in... Yeah. Oh, go ahead, Armstrong. No, I'm just supporting what you said. And there are literature, uh, this thing, how do they call it? Systematic literature reviews on some of these topics on health and uh, thing sustainability in a way. And uh, you have to know that metrics that capture health and sustainability are not like individual metrics. So sometimes people will really focus on a group of metrics that are measurable and more related to what they are doing. Another project might not include all that same uh, metrics. So how you fit in that line, you need some kind of this systematic literature review or even full research papers or works that are available to guide your choice. Because once you are guided empirically, you can hardly go wrong in making some of those decisions. Now, you remember in the early days when people were talking about sustainability, everybody drifted in, towards energy immediately. And they thought sustainability is to reduce energy. But later on, Scientifically, they said, no, energy is not even a, a, an issue per se, because a data center now in, let's say in snow, uh, very cold areas where snow is an issue, they need heating. So they are now transforming energy from one form to another. So that equation became, the, the argument became a bit weak. So they are now looking into the socio-technical aspect where human factors cannot control, like improving the code, the how people write code, best practices, onboarding, those kind of things. That's where the discussion is going more or less. I mean, the literature review advise you more on this kind of uh, stand to take. But as Sean says, the initial place is to use snowball sampling because you identify a key player in a community now once you discuss with those person you cannot ask for referral but then you try to make sure you don't rely on snowball because that person can create a, a social network of its own clique which becomes a biased network and you end up not having the objective truth so once you have a, a view try as much as possible to discern as you are talking with people so that their biases should not create a link okay I think I get what you mean. I I can um try it with the literature review and um asking open ended um mm -hmm. questions to yeah to interview uh, to yeah using the snowball. I, I've I've read um similar uh, approach uh, in I think in in a work of um to study about the qualities of grid maintainers uh, using the snowball approach to um mm -hmm. ask them the qualities they think uh, yeah um okay thanks for the suggestion i think that's that's all i wish to discuss and i've re i've I, I think i've received um a lot of um today so uh, i will stop share my screen now Okay, thank you for sharing. So, Sean, I think we were some, uh, you were looking for something uh, for Zaius. Uh, 
how do you pronounce your name properly, please? Is this Zia? Joya? Pro- correct me. Joya, I think it is. Is that right? Joya. Okay. Yeah, okay. that's right. <laughs> Thank you. Sean, you were looking for something be, uh, before her presentation. Yeah, so I, I went through the, the metrics uh, list and uh, looking at that issue that we were talking about earlier, I created new metric uh, lines in the, the evolution working group for issues updated, issues comment, issue comments and downloads. And then I identified an existing metric for change request linked with issues, an existing proposed metric. And then I think seven and eight, change request issue age and change request processing time are simply filters on the change requests metrics. So those already exist. Okay. Um, and I didn't venture into the CI stuff because I didn't see anything. And uh, I think it's lower priority anyhow. Yeah, I think the CI thing, we it's something that we started discussing just like of recent. Yeah, the boss it's, and things like, yeah. It's, it's ultimately important. I just think the other ones are more yeah. urgently needed. Okay. Based, based on my participation in the metric model working group. Okay. Um, okay. So an issue is updated could very well be like, I haven't looked closely, but it could, um, yeah. I'm just looking at, uh, so on this issues. metrics, yeah. okay. Go ahead. I'm strong. No, on this metrics, uh, where did you put the, so I, um, how did you highlight it? Yeah. yeah. Let me share my screen here. So I didn't highlight them because when I create different colors, it drives other people crazy. <laughs> oh, <laughs> but uh, so what I noted is so change request issue mapping, this already exists. And I just added this MM related to the okay. description. And when I created issues updated and issue comments, I, I just put MM related in the description. Okay. I didn't make any note about the the um, seven and eight other than uh, in here I note that they are filters on the existing change request metric change okay. request link with issues we highlighted CI we skipped yeah so I think that covers everything in that list so if we so I, I put them in in progress optimistically um, but we could go and like uh, like issues updated and issue comments are the two with no conceptualization yet. I don't know if there's any progress on change request issue mapping. It could, no, it's just a template. Okay. I don't even know if this is the right template, but I'm going to assume that it is. I want to believe so. Yeah. But I think the change request, oh no, this is change request issue mapping. Yep. Not just change request. Okay. That's a difference. So we could create um, blank ones under here as well. Yeah. Essentially, there's. It looks like that. In my view, there's like three that could be developed in parallel: the issue updated, issue comments, um, and I see maybe downloads is the other one I was thinking of. Or yeah, downloads. I put downloads in here somewhere. I thought, yeah, here's downloads under, I put it under community growth. I didn't know, if, didn't exactly know where it might belong, but I thought community growth made sense as a category. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's my first cut at it. So there's, I guess there's four that we could, um, could be developing. Two of them are, one of them already has a, Google Doc with the template. Is there a, uh, just take this. I think it's the most current template.
So change uh, so issues updated is one we need. I can type really. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um then, update. And then the other one was shoot comments. Oops, extra T there. All right, and another one was downloads. Yeah. All right, well, that's three. All right, so it's downloads, issue comments. Are we just splitting these up then? Yeah, well, I'm putting them, I'm, I'm creating the documents that we need to work on. And then I think okay. as a practical matter, I could take one and uh, for the next meeting uh, to develop. And I don't know if Armstrong, if you can take one or. Yeah. So yeah, I created the three documents for downloads, updated and comments. And there was already one for change request issue mapping. Actually, there's two for change, I guess. Actually, this is entirely repeated. This change request issue mapping is, I think it's got two lines. <laughs> Yeah, there is change request. Okay, no, there is change code. Oh no, no, different things. Sorry. These are the. Th this is the same as this. Okay. Like these are identical. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna delete the one that I didn't comment on. Yeah, I mean, I think um, that's what we should do for next time. So I'll take, um, you can put me in the notes for um, issues updated and issue comments. Uh, do you want to do any, Armstrong? I think the downloads and the... Uh... Wait, let me see which other one is there. Mm. There was a change request issue mapping, possibly. Okay. Okay, good. Thank you, Anonymous Lama, for logging this. What was the other one you said? Issue updates and what else? Issue comments. Backyard has become overrun with squirrels because I had to take down a giant tree in my front yard. And I think I probably created like 50 homeless squirrels. I'm going to find a home soon well, there's, in your there, home. Oh. There have been, been little I squirrel Sean, fights. I yeah. think Sean suggested that I take download and the... The issue pull request mapping. Okay, thanks.
All right. I think we got like 10 minutes before the next meeting, right? Yeah. So I'm going to take that, that break in between the meetings, Armstrong and Elizabeth. And um, Okay. Just before you go, Sean, did you create yeah. a template for the, the mapping, the issue request mapping? Um, that already existed. Um, and if we look at the spreadsheet, it's under code development efficiency. Okay. Um, and there's, it's blank. There's nothing actually done there, but somebody did copy and paste the template. Probably me. <laughs> okay. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. Because I was just looking in the document folder, but I didn't see the template there. Yeah, it may have, it may have been created somewhere else. Let okay. me, um, I can take a look at that real quick here.